So we're going to start uh, in about a minute at 5.33. We have a very packed show today, so I'm very excited. Five thirty-three, and I will go ahead and start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the eighth session of Urge. It's so good to have all of you here with us for a session entitled Racism and Accountability. My name is Vashon Wright, and I will be your host for the Urge finale. I'll start with a few comments. Sometimes there are disconnects between leaders and those who are led especially as it relates to the topics of belonging, accessibility, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Sometimes those who are being led believe that leadership buy-in is what is needed to spark and maintain change. Sometimes it becomes frustrating when everyone realizes that leadership by leadership buy-in exists, but does not immediately solve the problems, which are centuries old, deeply entrenched in our systems, sometimes misinformation, a shift in priorities, and the competing interests make seeking change feel like an Herculean task, a constant, never-ending uphill battle. And sometimes, we get excited by new initiatives that we believe will work. Urge being a prime example. To solve the pro these problems, we, the leader, and those being led, need to figure out how best to speak to each other, understand each other, empathize with each other, and see situations from each other's perspectives. Those outside of leadership need to better understand what it takes to manage change, what it takes to run an institution or, or a department, what limitations exist, and why some decisions are taken and others are not taken. In essence, there needs to be transparency. But this thing called transparency is not easy to do sometimes, given the potentials for misunderstandings or the limitations on everybody's time. But without transparency, change and progress stalls. Leaders and those in power, we need to constantly remember the goal of our work and our institutions. It is to provide nourishing, healthy, and productive environments for people we work with, because ultimately relationships, good, healthy, and productive relationships is what it takes and what makes life worth living and this work, geoscience, worth doing. So near the end of the live sessions for Urge, I urge patience, open lines of communications. I urge caution and the constant pursuit of progress. Don't give up when leadership buy-in does not fix things. Don't give up when your pod members stop regularly attending meetings. Don't give up when members take the racism out of this work. Don't give up when urge doesn't fix all the problems by the end of the summer or by the end of this year. Don't stop pursuing strong, bold, anti-racist actions. And please stick around till the end of this session where I will reveal the future of urge. Let's get started with the finale. We have three amazing speakers scheduled for tonight, followed by an inclusivity tip and a question and answer session. As usual, if you have questions during the presentations, 
please put them in the Q&A box and we will try our best to get to as many as possible near the end. Our first speaker today is Dr. Mika Estrada. Dr. Estrada received her doctoral degree in social psychology from Harvard University and is now an associate professor in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences and the Institute for Health and Aging at the University of California, San Francisco. Her research program focuses on social influence, including the study of identity, values, kindness, well being, and integrative education. Currently, she is engaged in several longitudinal studies which involve implementing and assessing interventions such as science training programs, mentorship and curriculum changes aimed to increase student persistence in STEM careers. Dr. Estrada's work focuses on ethnic populations that are historically underrepresented in higher education, most, vul most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and are providing diverse and creative solutions to present challenges of our day. As a leading scholar on the issues of diversity and inclusion, she serves on the National Academies Committee, was a Leadership Institute Fellow with the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science, or known as SACNAS, in 2013, and received the Adolphus Tolliver Award for Outstanding Research in 2016. Dr. Estrada will give her presentation on her paper, Improving Underrepresented Minority Student Persistence in STEM. Dr. Estrada. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. And um, I'm delighted to be able to share with you a paper that was written a while ago, but I think has increased in relevance uh, in recent times. So I'm gonna share my screen and um, kind of walk you through, I think most of you have read this paper, but I am going to try and give it some context and also maybe make some comments about how to update it a little bit. So first of all, the, the title, <laughs> you know, when we did this, uh, we used underrepresented minority. And since then, the terminology continues to change. I now use historically underrepresented typically to kind of represent the fact that, that we're not necessarily underrepresented anymore. Uh, David Asai used the term persons excluded because of race and ethnicity. I noticed that that was on the reading list, and I have also been using peers in some of my talks. And then, of course, BIPOC has come up with Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So just to update it, that this, this term, even in the last couple of years, has changed. This paper really came from a meeting that was held at Howard Hughes Medical Institute and started, we met, I think, three times together. And it was co-hosted workshop with um, a working group that was hosted by NIH and HHMI. And they brought a bunch of scholars together uh, to discuss this topic. And these were the collaborators that were with me um, through this journey and who, who contributed to this paper. So I can't take credit for just about anything in this paper. I mean, it was really a, a work in progress for all of us. And you can see from this list, if you know people who's who in this, in this field, these are you know, some of the leading uh, researchers in the field of diversifying STEM fields. And we came together and as what happens at Howard Hughes Medical Institute, when you come for a working group, you arrive, you eat together, and then they put you to work. And so we arrived and we worked the first night and we were told that we would have the next day to address this issue of how would we diversify uh, the STEM workforce and that we'd be divided into three different groups and that we would uh, have time to talk about this. And then on our final day, we would present, these three groups would present thoughts to a larger group. So, but the first task when we arrived was for us to bring to this meeting demographics from our institutions of the STEM students who were enrolled right now, that were graduating from our university and by discipline of enrollment and at graduation. So that was part of our assignment before we arrived. And when we got there, we realized, all of us realized how difficult it was to find this data. Uh, often the use of how ethnicities were defined and race were defined were different, sometimes used differently across different um, divisions and different departments. The university often was not tracking these clearly. And uh, we all found it to be a really a mighty, a mighty task. When we wrote this paper, in fact, this uh, image was in the paper, but it what didn't exist prior to then. We, we had to collect this data from 
different places. So the information on postdocs was different from information that was on master's students or bachelor's students. How STEM was defined uh, varied across different kinds of data sets. How underrepresented minorities was defined varied across different data sets. And so we really had to go through and break it apart. And so you look at when you look at the first recommendation um, that we had, you'll see that we it was informed by that experience. The second task that we had after bringing our data was to break up into these three groups and to identify what we would do, what we would recommend uh, to diversify the STEM fields and to increase persistence. And the idea was that by us having these three groups working independently, we would come up with unique ideas and then we would present these the following day in DC to people who are from different funding agencies and kind of thought leaders so we were going to have to work really fast, come up with what we agreed upon, and then publicly present it. That was that was the plan. What happened was, though, that when we got into our divisions and we got into our small groups and came up with some ideas, we came back together, and there was tremendous overlap across the three groups, so much so that it didn't make sense for us to have three different presentations. And so that night, uh, Silvio Hurtado and a few others of us stayed up all and made slides so we could have the presentation. And we actually ended up doing a unified one group presentation on what our recommendations were because there was so much shared um, conception of what was needed. So these were the recommendations. And if uh, you all read the paper, you kind of know them, but let me just build on them a little bit. So the increase in institutional accountability, this was really comes from knowing that you don't know whether you're doing it well or not if you don't know where you are. There's no way to celebrate success. There's no way to, to know what isn't working uh, in a campus if you don't actually know how many students are, are continuing on doing course progression in, in STEM or falling away. And if you can't identify uh, the graduation rates and stuff for your, for your departments. Equally true is faculty, right? You know, what faculty is staying, what faculty is going. I think we're starting to move towards doing this more effectively now than when we wrote the paper, but the information systems that universities have, this was like the, the bottom line, right? We need to know this in order to know whether we're doing well or not and knowing where we're doing well. So using data as kind of the, the, the key piece that makes the rest work. And without that, it's hard to know all we have are stories to tell instead of really being able to be data driven. The second element was creating strategic partnerships with programs that create lift. And this has to do with, there's a lot of evidence on certain kinds of programs that are working, working well, uh, science training programs. We kind of know, <laughs> there's actually a lot of knowledge about what works well, but what happens is a lot of times people are funded to do, let's say they're gonna run a um, undergraduate research program. So they get money from NIH to run this undergraduate research program. They've never done this before, and they start to reinvent the wheel. They don't recognize that there's a whole bunch of literature out there on how to do this well and in an inclusive way and in a way that, that really builds camaraderie and community. So learning from what's there instead of thinking that, that you're, you have to make it up from the bottom down was, was really key. And then unleashing the power of curriculum. There has also been a lot of research and we're actually moving in this direction right now in terms of, of um, how to build anti-racist curriculum. Like that's the, new, that's the new thing that we're seeing coming up. But at the time when this was written, we were talking about freshman research ex intensive experiences and having courses that really help uh, tie the curriculum to the community and what the community needs. And we know that that's very good for all students, but particularly good for first generation and um, historically underrepresented groups. Address student resource disparities. This is a real thing. And I think COVID has really actually driven this home even more so. And I hear this from, from faculty who now have a better sense of kind of the challenges that their students have been enduring while they're trying to get an education. Some having less access to to Wi-Fi and computers and quiet and all of those types of things, but also people who are having to work and help support their families and all of these kinds of things. So really addressing the resource disparity is, is essential and, and, and important. And then firing the creative juices, which has to do with making sure that what we're doing has joy and, and has um, meaning. So it was really interesting at this meeting because it, we were asked, why did you go into science? And not one person there said, it's because I like to memorize information. 
that was not the reason. <laughs> what they said was, you know, that it was interesting. I got to be creative and I got to think through things. And I mean, there was all this like beautiful thinking that really draws people in. And yet a lot of students in the, tr in the classic training don't actually get to that until they're maybe in their junior or senior year, if they're lucky. So tying the curriculum and tying opportunities into creative, creative juices was part of what we thought was really essential. Key to this was doing this in a way in which we know when we're going in the right direction. And this is a, a classic action research model from Kurt Lewin back in the 1950s. Of course, it's been updated. There's new names for it. There's community-based action research. There's all kinds of things. But the basic element of all of these is that you kind of evaluate the situation. You, you look at it. You actually have numbers, right? What is happening in our institution, in my department? You diagnose where are the barriers, where are the opportunities to increasing inclusion, um, justice, uh, anti-racism, all of those things that we want to have, right? Then you put together a plan of action, you take the action, and then you reevaluate. You collect data again and say, is this working or not? And you go around and around the circle. What often was happening, what we were seeing happening, is that the evaluate was kind of there, not quite there, diagnosis, well, we did something, you know, and there's really no tracking of what is happening. So I, this is really, really key. I think using data and action kind of in a circular motion is really important for us knowing when we're making progress and how we're making progress. That I don't think has changed. What has changed is that the world has changed. This last year all by itself has brought about all kinds of crazy, challenging, um, hard and difficult things. We have disruptions because of COVID. We have disruptions because of racial injustice. We have disruptions because of climate change. Um, we have some major things happening in our, in our um, world right now, which has, I think, awakened us. And I think this, this gathering here and this program has been a result of, of some of this awakening that's happening. And I think that we're at a point right now where um, there's openings to make change happen because there's so much pressure on the system. Everything, one of the things that Kurt Lewin used to say was that in order to change an institution, it has to unfreeze from the, from the norms and the responsibilities and the kind of structure that it had in order for it to reframe itself. And right now we are in a place in which things are very unfrozen, which gives lots of opportunity to do things in a different way going forward. And I just want to note that it hasn't changed too much. <laughs> so this came out, you can see April 26, 2021, US National Academy picks record number of women and minorities as part of diversity push. That's what they wrote. Uh, somebody corrected this. I saw it on Twitter. They said, uh, because, of, because of the amazing science is really what it should be reading. This idea that uh, there's a kind of tokenism that we're going to include women and minorities because that helps to create diversity, which the majority needs for some reason really undercuts and continues to undercut the the amazing science and work that people of color bipoc people are doing uh right now and so i think it's easy to think that we've changed but i even just looking at this i'm like we're still stuck in this idea that somehow we don't deserve to be here and that's that's really frustrating and i'm hoping that that's one of the things that we change is our messaging and the way that we talk about diversifying the stem fields well, all of this has made this article uh, more relevant than ever, I think, and that I can see that some universities are actually starting to utilize some of these, these pieces, and I'm excited about that, that we're actually putting it into motion. And with my last few minutes here, I just want to talk a little bit about what comes after this paper. So I think we have to envision what we could be. We have to envision that, because without really seeing it, we don't actually know where we're going to. This is a great paper that just came out. It's called Reimagining STEM Workforce Development as a Braided River. And the idea of this is that people now, learners, are not people who come into the academic world and then leave, and that's it. People are weaving in and out of the academic system. And for those of us who come from my minoritized groups, you know, we often come in and out various ways because of, of lots of different things that come in, different priorities 
sometimes. But this is a beautiful idea that we are, and it's in the paper, actually, that we give lift so that people can flow down, right? That they can move through their, their career progression. And so what helps people to stay in that and feel comfortable coming in and out of it is developing a holistic kind of inclusive environment. And when I think about an inclusive and excellent institution that has accessibility and justice and equity and diversity and inclusion, I think of this, this is what my dream is. Uh, my dream is, is that we attend to the heart of people, the full person, that there's kindness and belonging, that everybody's experiencing that, that there's very low micro and macro aggressions and there's very high micro and macro affirmations. When I give talks, usually I give talks about how do you grow the good stuff? There is so much emphasis on how to get rid of the negative stuff, how to get rid of racism, how to get rid of prejudice, how to get rid of this and that. But you know what, you could get rid of all of those things and if you don't grow the positive stuff, it's still not going to be enough. If I walk into a room and nobody smiles at me, but at least nobody makes bad faces at me, um, it's still not a sense. I just still don't have a sense of belonging. So I think we have to grow the good stuff. I it's okay to get rid of the negative stuff. We do need to do that. But I think at the same time, we need to grow the positive. The second element is in the mind. For the mind, we need academic excellence. I think we've put a lot of emphasis on this and we know a lot about what kind of curriculum and mentorships and co-curricular activities are very good for increasing inclusion. They're usually good for everybody, not just um, minoritized groups. For the body, I think we need security enough that we feel safe, that we have food and water and shelter and all those things. But in addition to that, one of the things that cues us that we are in a safe environment is that there's people who look like us and who are who share our cultures in all different levels of an institution. So that means that there's people like me in faculty positions, staff positions, administrative positions, and student positions. So my ideal institution has good representation across the whole institution. And then finally, that for the spirit, that there's um, opportunities for creativity and meaning making for everybody who's on campus, not just for some. So I'm hoping that this is what we're moving towards and that the paper lays out kind of a framework for how to get to this, but I wanna give a vision of like what is possible and what we can be moving towards. And then last, I love this quote by James Baldwin, which says, those who say it can't be done are usually interrupted by those others doing it. And I think that that's what this group is about. These are, at least from looking at the videos and so I tried to like prep myself before doing this to kind of see who you guys were and I thought, this is really amazing. Like you really are trying to work towards how do we, how do we move towards the impossible and really transform our institutions so that they never go back to the way that they were. So post COVID is not going back, but post COVID is going forward into a different kind of world and a more inclusive place. That would be wonderful for me. And as a Latina who went through Berkeley and Harvard, I know <laughs> from personal experiences um, how exhausting it can be to try and get through this academic world when it's not your main culture and when the value system of the culture system is not your own. So I'm excited to know there's people out there like you all who are, are trying to, to move this, this rock up the hill. And that is all I have to add today, so. Thank you so much, Mika. Uh, I really love your paper and uh, the work that you've been doing. I would like to now introduce our next speaker, Dr. Margaret Leinen. Dr. Leinen is the 11th director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Uh, she also serves as UC San Diego's vice chancellor for marine sciences and the dean of the School of Marine Sciences. She joined UC San Diego in October, 2013. Dr. Leinen is an award-winning oceanographer and a distinguished national and international leader in ocean science, global climate, and environmental issues. Her research in paleoceanography and paleoclimatology focuses on ocean sediments and their relationship to global biogeochemical cycles and the history of Earth's ocean and climate. Dr. Leinen currently serves as a member of the Executive Planning Group of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and is a member of the Distinguished Leadership Council of the Joint Ocean Commission's Initiative. She's the vice chair of the research board of the 500 million Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. Dr. Leinen is also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Geological Society of America, the American Geophysical Union, 
and the Oceanography Society. Dr. Leinen also leads UC San Diego's Ocean, Earth, Atmosphere, and Climate Science Research and Education programs at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And that is a mouthful. Welcome, Dr. Leinen. Thank you so much, Bashan, and thank you all for the opportunity to talk to you. And uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Vashon asked me to talk a little bit about the, um, the process for creating change and a little bit about lessons learned and challenges. So I will, I'll focus more on that than on specifics of what's going on at, uh, uh, at UC San Diego. So, um, one of the, the real keys for creating change, especially around this issue of uh, racism and diversity is enabling uh, leaders across the institution so that it isn't one person's responsibility or just my responsibility, but every, more people know that it's their responsibility. And uh, at Scripps, uh, we, we certainly have a, a fantastic group that is really focused on this. And right at the center is Kira Azan, who is our Director of Diversity Initiatives. Uh, and she is amazing, but of course can't do it all herself. And so uh, in the upper left, we also have Jen McKinnon, who is an Associate Dean for Faculty Equity. Uh, and the lower left, Peter Franks, who is the Department Chair, who uh, has led uh, initiatives in uh, in better mentoring, in, uh, in increasing diversity among faculty, uh, and in, uh, in um, anti-bullying. Uh, at the lower right, uh, you'll see Helen Fricker. At, at UC, uh, department chairs are considered administrative positions. And so there's also a faculty chair that's erect, elected by the faculty, and that's Helen Fricker. And she has really led uh, a group this, uh, this past year that she's been chair in focusing on, um, on racism and anti-bullying. And then in the upper right, Lahini Alawahari, uh, who was a former uh, faculty equity advisor and just has been a, a supreme leader across the, the SIO part of the university. Uh, at the graduate student level, we have a set of community engagement fellows uh, who uh, have paid fellowships. Uh, the top row are the graduate student fellows and the bottom row are the undergraduate student fellows. And these are the people who really come up with a lot of the most creative ideas uh, for engaging uh, all of us in the work of anti-racism and enhancing diversity. Uh, but it's also necessary to ensure that all parts of the uh, institution play a role in being a Jedi. And so my entire senior staff have responsibilities every year to identify what they are doing in their area to enhance our diversity and to uh, work against racism. And so whether it's fundraising for raising funds specifically for BIPOC students, uh, for fellowships and research supports, or whether it's the, um, the marine facilities, recruiting a diverse ship's crew, or anti-bias and harassment training for the crew and for techs, communications, really stepping up to do a much better job of highlighting diverse faculty, students, and staff in our communications, in our tweets, in our social media, in our press releases, and so forth. And even our Birch Aquarium, which has half a million visitors a year, but does uh, incredible outlook, outreach to schools in San Diego County, has expanded its existing outreach to local BIPOC communities. So it takes a village is the first message. And, uh, and that includes people that aren't part of the faculty or student body as well. So what about increasing accessibility? Here, I think that being creative with processes to increase in accessibility is really a key. Um, so here in California, we have Prop 209, which precludes any preference for underrepresented groups in hiring or in admissions. So how do you 
do something to enhance your ability to attract BIPOC faculty and students when you can't give them preference. One of the things that we do, did was change our entire philosophy of hiring. Uh, Scripps used to hire primarily at the associate professor and full professor level. Now we've turned that around to hire at the assistant professor level as much as possible because that's where the, the uh, pool is most diverse and we have the greatest chance of hiring uh, BIPOC faculty. Of course, unconscious bias training for all searches, but we've really moved to very proactive outreach to underrepresented scholars to, uh, to bring them into searches. Uh, as of this fall, over the last, last six years, we've hired two black faculty, two indigenous faculty, one Pacific Islander faculty, two Latinx and Hispanic faculty who joined two that were already here six years ago. So these are small numbers, absolutely. Uh, but this is about 40% of the new positions at Scripps in the last six years. So it's really showing that by targeting uh, the way that we do searches and the level at which we search, we have a much uh, better uh, opportunity to hire diversity in spite of the restrictions against, um, against any preference. Our latest is that we've uh, joined the rest of UC San Diego in uh, an opportunity that the UCs have provided for advancing faculty diversity. Uh, and we will be hiring two faculty who can teach at Scripps and in the African American Studies program. And we've already seen uh, some of the applicants for this, and it's a very diverse group. So these are, I think, the, 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 the key message is that you have to use every strategy available to you and really be proactive in, in moving the needle uh, on faculty searches. At the uh, student level, um, we've initiated, uh, again, trying to be very proactive, uh, we've initiated uh, a workshop for underrepresented uh, students from minority serving institutions to chat with a faculty member or a graduate student at Scripps. And this program is designed to demystify the application and admission process, as well as create a more personal connection with prospective students. And we've had many students say, Scripps was just not on my list before, but as a result of talking to you, as a result of hearing your, uh, your focus on increasing the number of BIPOC students, I'm going to apply. And so I, this is, again, an example of that real need to be proactive. Once they do apply, uh, the work of our diversity admissions committee is really helping. They have developed a more holistic rubric for uh, admissions, provided training and resources for that, building on materials provided by the California Consortium for Inclusive Doctoral Education. And those new rubrics are aimed at providing a means of assessing a student's potential, not based totally on their scholarly achievements, which are often a function of opportunities they re received, but also on their leadership efforts, their contributions to diversity, and the distance traveled, not physical distance, but uh, the, their, their story, what, what they have done and how far they have, uh, have come themselves. So some of the lessons and challenges associated with that, the lessons obviously be, cre be creative, uh, use every opportunity, be proactive. Uh, but the challenge is just because you admit students doesn't mean they will come. And we still have uh, students who, who tell us after they're admitted, thanks, but no thanks. I'd like to go to a place that has more BIPOC students uh, and where I'll feel more at home. So uh, that's an opportunity for me to give special thanks to all the underrepresented scholars who came to Scripps Oceanography, even though our faculty and student numbers for their group were small, because you're building the community for us to, uh, the foundation for us to grow on. And we're committed to admitting and hiring more scholars from your group. This is a real challenge for uh, majority institutions 
uh, to to say how can we how can we reach out and convince you that you will have uh, a good opportunity here and a good uh, career here, even though our numbers are small. Another point is that enhancing diversity is not only about numbers. Accepting different perspectives on how to approach geoscience is also important. And last week we had a wonderful webinar uh, that included Professor Amelia Moore from URI. And she said, diversity needs to begin by looking inward and must be open to disciplinary rethinking. It is not BIPOC doing the same research in the same way and the same topics as has been done by whites for decades. Uh, and that's a, a really important thing for all of us to understand that the very nature of what we do and how we do it is going to change and must change uh, as we increase the BIPOC population in geoscience. And that's a good thing. As an example, Professor Isabel Rivera Callazo, uh, who is a joint faculty member between Scripps Oceanography and Anthropology, works on climate change impacts, but her work emphasizes the need to include indigenous communities in decisions about climate change, uh, climate change adaptation, and to learn from their long-lived experience. And so we have focused on getting Isabel's word and her kind of research out, not only because she does it and she's excellent, because it's a way to communicate with the rest of the world that we need to change what we think of as research, as well as who's doing the research. So building a sense of belonging at Scripps or anywhere. I think it's, uh, it, it's really important to provide uh, a home for various affinity groups, a place where they can talk with each other on a regular basis. And we're very fortunate now to have a whole array of those affinity groups. They meet monthly, uh, they set their own agenda, and it's a safe space for them to talk. So we have affinity groups for Black, Latinx, Hispanic, Native Indigenous, Asian Pacific Islander, Middle Eastern, Desi. And then also want to emphasize that international queer and first gen are important because of the intersectionality uh, uh, between uh, BIPOC and those, uh, and those areas. Many of our BIPOC are first gen gen or queer or international, they have other affinities. And so uh, you can be a member as, as, many of, as many affinity groups as you affiliate with. Uh, I'm, the, the chancellor is going to talk about uh, the anti-racism reboot at UC uh, San Diego as a whole. I'll just say that we felt that it was so important that we rebooted uh, down at the, the Scripps campus to, uh, to do this in a, with a Scripps focus. Uh, so also another point I think in, in processes for creating change is listening and listening to what is wanted. And I'll give you another lessons learned. Uh, last year after uh, the George, George Floyd murder, uh, my staff uh, said, we want to show that we're supportive uh, so let's put up uh, a sign on the campus that that you know recognizes this and that says that we support our black students, faculty, and staff at this difficult time. The next time I met with the black affinity group, they said, "Why did you put up that sign?" So I said, "We wanted to show that we were uh, supporting you at this difficult time." And they said, "Why didn't you just put up a sign that said Black Lives Matter?" And we said, we wanted it to be more personal to, to you, to the people of Scripps. And they pointed out that this essentially was Scripps claiming that we support our black students, faculty and staff in all of the ways that they need to be supported. And they said, you know, we really don't feel supported at the level that we want to be. Uh, so, um, uh, so I said, well, do you want us to take down the sign and put up a sign that says Black Lives Matter? And that resulted in a really great conversation, uh, at the end of which one of our students said, we'll take it as a commitment that you will commit 
to provide more support in more, in more different ways. So I think it's really important for us as leaders to listen to what uh, our BIPOC are, are experiencing and what it means to them when we may go into something with good intentions, but if it doesn't work for them, it doesn't work for them. Uh, so uh, I mentioned that, that although we have uh, affinity groups for all of those, we, we don't have uh, a big community of black students, faculty and staff. So we started monthly web discussions with black leaders in geoscience around the country. And uh, this, this was, uh, it's called Deep Connections. And through it, we've had opportunities for our students, faculty and staff to broaden the conversation and broaden the exchange of, uh, of information with others outside of, of Scripps. And I think that's another uh, important tool that we have, that if we don't have a community on our campus, build one, even if that involves reaching out to other universities and other communities. And then finally, ensuring accountability for change. So the, uh, as you'll hear from Chancellor Kosla, uh, every unit uh, at, at uh, UC San Diego has to give an accountability report for our equity, diversity, and inclusion actions every year. And I developed that accountability report in partnership with all of the, with, uh, all of the leadership on EDI at Scripps. And in it, I have to own what we make progress on and what we don't make progress on. And for those things that we don't make progress on, provide an idea of what strategies we're going to try next. What are we going to do to overcome that inertia? So I think that ensuring accountability, uh, even in the, the face of really difficult challenges is really important. And finally, I'd like to emphasize that the challenges will continue and that even after geoscience creates anti-racist policies and strategies, we will struggle with the lack of familiarity with geoscience as a field with good high paying jobs that work on problems relevant to the BIPOC community. And I think that the legacy of geoscience involving uh, resource exploitation and activities that have not included BIPOC communities it is going to be an obstacle for some time. Uh, you know, on last week's Deep Connection, uh, Marshall Shepard joined us and he said uh, he still uh, uh, struggles with BIPOC uh, people that have been uh, admitted as graduate students who say, uh, my family are not wild about me going into this area. They say with my great grades, why don't I become a lawyer? Why don't I become a doctor? Uh, why don't I become something where I can have a bigger lever to change uh, the experience of the BIPOC community? And I think that this is something that we all have to accept in geoscience, that our legacy of exploitation is going to mean that it'll take time to convince people that geoscience can be different, not only in who is a geoscientist, but what a geoscientist does. So with that, thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, to talk about some of these challenges and uh, strategies. Thank you so much, Margaret, uh, for a wonderful presentation. Now we'll uh, shift to uh, Dr. Pradeep Khosla. Dr. Khosla became UC San Diego's eighth chancellor on August 1st, 2012. As, a UC San, as UC San Diego's chief executive officer, he leads a campus with more than 40,000 40, students, seven undergraduate colleges, six academic divisions, and six graduate and professional schools. UC San Diego is also home to Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which I will be a professor at uh, beginning July 1st, 2020. UC San Diego is recognized as one of the top 15 research uses universities in the world and is the largest civilian employer based in San Diego. Uh, Dr. Kosla has a number of other um, 
awards. He's elected a member of the American Academies of Art and Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, and the American Society for Engineering Education. And he has to leave in 15 minutes. So I'm going to cut my introduction short and uh, give him the floor. Uh, Dr. Kosla will uh, give his presentation on the role of leadership in supporting anti-racist actions and the challenges that will still likely exist regarding racism, even after geoscientists create robust anti-racist policies and strategies. Dr. Kosla. Thank you, Dr. Wright, and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this great meeting today. Uh, it's indeed an honor for me to join this panel in discussing the essential and crucial work of anti-racism. And uh, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, I will not be using slides. I'll just uh, read my remarks and then happy to answer any questions after that. Uh, so like you said, uh, Dr. Wright, I've been asked to discuss the role of university leadership in supporting anti-racist actions. And also to share some insights on how leadership can support these actions through policy and provide accountability. And you heard a little bit about this uh, and uh, what uh, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography is doing under Margaret's leadership. So as I talk about what we are doing, let me just remind and tell everybody, there's only one word that is significant in everything I'm gonna say. And that key word is action, action in all capitals, A-C-T-I-O-N. So our goal is to address the issue of how to eradicate racism uh, systematically throughout UC San Diego. And back to what uh, Mika was saying, Dr. Estrada was saying, uh, it's not about eradication only, it's also about building an infrastructure around it uh, that makes it more positive uh, so that the two work together. So there are multiple ways we do that and there are multiple ways one can do that. So let me talk about this in five different areas. Number one, you need to build a roadmap. It's important to know what road are you gonna follow. Number two, you need to revise your, revise, revise your business processes. Business processes control a lot of the culture within an institution. And understanding that is important. So you need to revise some of these processes. Number three, you gotta unmask your campus culture. Uh, it's easy to create initiatives here and there uh, without ever thinking about what change are they making. Um, and we see that in the context of demands all the time. There are these demands, then we may create these initiatives, but they really have not much impact. So that's not good. So we need to unmask your campus culture, invest in inclusion. Diversity is not necessary, it's, it's necessary, but diversity by itself is not sufficient. You need to have inclusion. You can have a diverse campus, which is non-inclusive. Uh, and I think uh, Dr. Estrada kind of alluded to that by saying, even if I, when I walk into a room, if nobody smiles at me, I don't feel welcome, right? And that's really important to know. And fifth is communicate and reinforce often, communicate and reinforce everywhere, and keep on repeating this loop of communication and reinforcement. So let me just quickly move through these five areas and what is it that we are doing at UC San Diego? So not long after I first arrived here, it's nearly nine years now, uh, we created the university's first ever uh, institutional strategic plan. And from that process, an important strategic goal emerged. And the goal was that UC San Diego will cultivate, and will cultivate a diverse and inclusive university community. Uh, this is simply stated, easy to say, very difficult to implement and then measure, right? But nonetheless, that's what we've been doing, implementing and measuring. And, and we, would imp we would create a community that encourages respectful open dialogue and challenges itself to take bold actions. And one of those bold actions was the creation of our strategic plan for inclusive excellence, which was led by Dr. Becky Pettit, who's our vice chancellor for equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we defined three goals uh, within this plan. Number one was access and success. The second goal was climate. And the third goal was accountability. And we set out to attract, retain, and support a diverse faculty, a diverse staff, and a diverse student body. You cannot have diversity in one aspect or one community or the other. You need to have diversity across the board, across all communities, and across all layers of the administration. Um, and the whole idea was we were doing this with the intent of literally creating a multilingual, multi-ethnic, multicultural environment on our campus where people could uh, prosper, people could succeed, and people could achieve their goals. 
Um, and we were also trying to replicate in some sense, the diversity of both California and the country. And we set out to create, and we also set out to create and foster a very positive and welcoming climate where we value and include and support everyone. And we set out to ensure institutional accountability throughout departments and divisions. And this is kind of important. Uh, before in the process of hiring, uh, the easy way out, if a department was not hiring the way we were expecting them to hire, was to say, oh, we had a faculty equity advisor on the committee and it was their responsibility. The simple answer is, it is not the faculty equity advisor's responsibility to make an institution more diverse. They are there to help, they are there to advise. It is the leadership, the chair of the department, the dean who have the hiring authority uh, to make, uh, to really insist on that outcome. And so we made them responsible. This was, by the way, the first, for the first time in the history of UC San Diego, that the chairs and the deans were being asked, were being asked to take account, were asked to become responsible and be accountable for the outcomes in their departments. Okay, so for right now, uh, we require each vice chancellor, and uh, Dr. Margaret Lyman kind of alluded to that, and each academic dean to tell us about the state of equity, diversity, and inclusion in their units annually. This is about, I don't know, about uh, two days of meetings, but I can tell you that I sit through those meetings, throughout those meetings, uh, and so does my executive vice chancellor, Dr. Elizabeth Simmons, and uh, obviously our uh, vice chancellor for equity and diversity, which is uh, Dr. Becky Pettit. So we expect our deans and our vice chancellors to create their own strategic plans detailing how they will advance EDI in their units. We have provided toolkits and we have provided best practices. Like I said, our job is to enable and empower and then hold people accountable uh, for what we expect them to deliver. And, and, the, and, the, and the leadership presents their annual, uh, their annual plan before a panel of specially trained faculty, staff, and students. So this is uh, the EDI outcomes on a yearly basis, the accountability meetings on a yearly basis. And the panel celebrates their progress, asks questions, provides feedback, and uh, keeps on uh, doing this year after year. So this will be the third year in a row we are doing it right now. And I can tell you this process has been successful in two ways. It clearly defines the expectation and it reinforces uh, and it reinforces inclusion in planning, budgeting, and performance review. And next up, we dive in and we revise your business processes. So in the interest of time, let me just concentrate on recruiting and hiring next. So first, ensure hiring committees are diverse. This is very important. A diverse hiring committee has a higher likelihood of creating a diverse pool. Um, and hiring needs to be an inclusive process from the very start. It cannot be inclusive at the very end. Uh, next, we ensure that candidate pools are diverse. It's not just that the candidate pools have to be diverse. The, div the candidate pool has to be diverse on a qualified basis, as in you need to have a pool of qualified diverse candidates. So this is extremely important because if all the candidates coming in are not qualified, you will end up at the end of the day uh, with a short list uh, that is not very diverse because you did not have qualified candidates up front. And this again is important because we are not trying to create diversity uh, and checking the box. We literally are trying to bring highly qualified people who are diverse and create diversity in that context. Uh, so like I said, hiring needs to be an inclusive process. Candidate pools have to be diverse. Uh, so one of the things that we have done is uh, we have created the our diversity hiring initiative, which we hope will bring about 13 new faculty focused on the black experience in STEM. So this is uh, a project that we created. It's called Advancing Faculty Diversity. And we focused diversity in this case in the context of STEM because most institutions will talk about diversity, but if you look at where the diversity lies, they lies it lies in a few departments. And that by itself does not create a broad-based inclusive experience for the students. And also it's not good for the faculty. So we wanna make sure that diversity is broadly defined and across the board. So the next two years, we're anticipating the creation of 10 to 20 new courses in STEM that are related to black experiences. And this focus on STEM adds to our existing social science and arts and humanities offerings. It strengthens our very popular or African-American studies minor 
and it sets the stage for our new BA in Black Diaspora and African American Studies. So our degree is designed with pathways between STEM and Black Studies in social science and arts and humanities. So you can see how we are weaving through uh, our various capabilities and making sure there's diversity across the board. Uh, what I've been talking about also forge, uh, forges the future, uh, future of Black STEM experience. And this, if you just think about what I've just said, sets us apart from about 90% or more of the, program, the U, programs in the US. It is taking effort and time, but I can tell you we are making a difference in diversifying our faculty. I'll give you some numbers. Since 2014, our total faculty grew by 17%. We saw a 21% increase in Latinx faculty and the number of black faculty grew by 59% and the number of women grew by 37%. So in my model of leadership and management, I call it disproportionate X, disproportionate recruiting, disproportionate hiring. And we use this strategy across every level, students, faculty, and staff. Uh, but we're also going further than just uh, hiring more black faculty. We now require all faculty candidates, for example, to submit a contribution to diversity statement as part of their application to UC San Diego. And this statement, as you can imagine, offers candidates the opportunity to reflect on their views about EDI. At the same time, it offers us the insight into how these candidates are thinking about EDI. So there are some examples of how to change your business processes. And this fundamental change, at least in my mind, I think, is helping us uh, build a better workforce that is more open-minded and more inclusivity-oriented or more inclusive uh, to begin with. And next, let me just talk a little bit about unmasking your campus culture. And what do I mean by this? So you have to really diagnose the campus environment very honestly. Uh, so for example, a few weeks ago, we hosted a symposium called Enhancing the Black Student Experience. And this symposium was created to increase awareness of the Black student experience at UC San Diego, the good and the bad, and everything uh, included. The week-long symposium was very dynamic. It was meaningful and extremely productive. And the reason I know this is not because I'm saying this, is because people actually sent me email after this symposium as to how useful it was and how they learned a few things. Uh, and I can say the same thing about our 21-day anti-racism challenge that we began last summer. We we're one of the first places to do this. Our entire campus, believe it or not, came together to listen and to learn. And yet, one more time, I got a lot of positive feedback from across the board saying how useful this was and how it opened people's eyes to issues uh, some thought never existed, some kind of knew they were existed, but were never sure as to how bad they were. But this was a very open conversation uh, led very ably by, again, Dr. Becky Pettit. And this also, this also helped us to identify where we should invest our time and our effort, right? So which, invest, which brings me to the other, the, the last point of invest, sorry, the fourth point of investing in inclusion. And this is back up your EDI goals with action. You cannot just have goals and meetings and meetings and initiatives and no actions. We need to back up our words with our own actions. So for example, what did we do? We hired a vice chancellor for equity, diversity and inclusion. Uh, this was about eight, seven years ago, funded an office of professionals to lead our campus-wide EDI efforts. And this vice chancellor, Dr. Becky Pettit, uh, partners with everyone on campus to help us understand where we are, where we need to go, and how we need to get there. We fund campus resource centers for affinity groups on campus to help students, faculty, and staff find comfort in the familiar while they learn and while they grow. We have the Black Resource Center, the Raza Resource Center, uh, Cross-Cultural Center, Intertribal Resource Center, LGBT Resource Center, and the Veterans Resource Center. Uh, so we have multiple resource centers and we are investing in them. In, in, investing in them. We also have the Asian Pacific Islander, Middle Eastern, Desi, American program, and a women's center on campus. We also fund comprehensive student support and success initiatives. And for example, we have created the Black Academic Excellence Initiative and the Latinx Chicanx Academic Excellence Initiative. So I know you are all listening to this and saying, wait a second, you're doing all of these things. And we are doing these things, not as one-off instances, but we are doing these things and they're all connected together. 
And at the same time, we are measuring uh, the culture and climate on campus to make sure that we're, we are indeed making progress, or as I like to say, we are moving the needle on this, right? Um, let me talk about one more thing. A few months ago, we also allocated two and a half million dollars for the Black Studies Project, which of course provides a venue for rigorous research, intellectual exchange, and cross uh, campus community of scholars. It strengthens our undergraduate and graduate work in Black Studies and it builds sustainable and mutually beneficial relationships with the broader San Diego and UC communities, a role that I believe uh, every public institution uh, should be adopting and embracing. So that's just one of the many examples of homegrown special projects. Now, my last bit of advice is to communicate and reinforce the inclusion and anti-racism message often and everywhere. People often listen to what the leadership is saying. They may not follow what the leadership wants them to do, but they will listen to what the leadership is saying. And I think at the end of the day, it actually has an impact on their actions. They really actually, it really does have an impact. So communicating the behavior that's expected of everyone is an important uh, role for a leader. So I keep on doing it all the time and as often as I can. Um, I regularly communicate and reinforce our changing campus culture. Like just like I'm doing right here. I communicate our successes and make it a point to address our failures. And I also communicate solidarity with communities that need us in times of crisis. Uh, and I reinforce our EDI goals at every possible opportunity. So inclusion must ooze out of every pore of your being. And you can see in the leadership at UC San Diego, this is indeed the case. Uh, let me just throw some more statistics at you, some numbers at you to give you an example of how we have caused diversity. So since 2012, so that's the day I came here, our undergraduate population grew by 40%, but our URG underrepresented groups grew by 92%. Our Chicanx Latinx population grew by 87.4%. Our African-American grew by 124%. And our Native American grew by 25%. So you can see the impact of disproportionate recruitment in this case. Uh, so let me just close by saying you cannot just do one thing. You have to do it all. You have to do it well. And you have to measure it all the time. So what do you have to do? In summary, you have to diversify the faculty. You have to diversify the students. You have to diversify the staff. You have to diversify academic programs. You have to provide support for everyone on campus to succeed. You have to keep on listening, keep on learning, and keep on changing, and it all works together to create a concrete change. So let me just say, Dr. Wright, thank you very much for this opportunity, and back to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Kosla. So a program in note, uh, I'm aware that we are over, we're now 6.34 Eastern Standard Time, and um, we have an inclusivity tip that we haven't played yet by Brandon Jones at the NSF that speaks about um, how do you create change in his experience from a funding body. And then there would be time for questions from the audience. And then I planned on revealing the future of Urge. And it seems like our uh, three speakers had a lot of very important things to say. And so if you're able to stay with us, uh, through the rest of the program. I expect it might take 20 to 25 minutes. Um, we welcome you to. Uh, and so now, um, Matt, can you please get the inclusivity tip by Brandon Joe? Well, um, lots to think about. A lot going on uh, in the world now and we are in this place within uh, the research enterprise that we're finally grappling with some long-seated long-rooted issues as um, they relate to race as it relates to the impact of devaluing um, groups of individuals based on characteristics that they had no control over. 
So when institutions, whatever that kind of institution is, academic, nonprofit, professional society, federal agency, uh, whatever, um, is deciding to that it's time, that it's, yeah, it's the right thing to do, but um, it's, it's about ethics and morality and not just feel good right thing, but actually the right thing to do. You know, what is it about the activities and the energy that these institutions need to grapple with that will sustain their efforts so that it's, it moves, the movement moves past rhetoric, moves past sessions and abstract submissions and um, grant funding and all of those temporary forces. What's going to sustain this as it needs to be sustained? Um, you know, how, how will institutions create that change in their institution that that will remain? What how, how will it remain? That's the question. Um, you know, so what's new revelations or new enlightenments for some communities or some groups or some individuals, some departments, and some labs, what, what's new for some um, has been the standard procedure for others. You know, it's like the new world mentality. We're, we're gonna, we being the royal we, and I'm, I'm <clears throat> um, I guess projecting myself into the past for all the quote unquote um, explorers of the time back uh, five, six, seven hundred years ago, or even more, when they talked about this side of the world, this this hemisphere, that this land that was not theirs, and they were going to see, or they discovered the new world, the new, you know, someone was already here. So we, we don't have to go into those levels of, of detail. We, we recognize that, but it's that same mentality now that the the scholarship the books the verbiage the models um, the programming the energy that many have developed have applied have had great success with um, is uh, the way that many of the communities that this work came out of ha have allowed the communities to be resilient and to be sustained. Um, and it's not new to those communities, but it's new all of a sudden to everyone else who's who's now coming in. So uh, one thing we could do is is make sure you critique yourself, or your your institution, be very candid about um, the self reflection that's necessary for that institution, and then be intentional about the scholarship that's already been done, seeking out that scholarship, but also engaging uh, the original people who generated that scholarship, center them, elevate them, value them in your own economy, because they're already valued because they're human, but they may be devalued in your economy. So, you know, critique what it is about your economy. What's the value system in your economy and what's the currency that makes your economy run and then ask yourself why am i seeking other currency why am i seeking other ways of knowing okay and not only why am i seeking but what am i prepared to do to allow the transference of that currency into my economy and for that currency to maintain its value. Because any time I go on vacation to another country, I carry with me the currency from my home country, but there is a, there's an exchange system that as best as it can, keeps the value of what I'm bringing so that I can operate in the, in the new realm that I'm moving into. So what are institutions going to do about adjusting their exchange rates 
and their economies to receive what people who've been excluded from that economy, what they're going to bring to that economy and, and make it even better. What are, what institutions going to do about that? Because once the currency gets moved into the economy and there's a new growth and production in the economy, then that's when the sustainability will happen, right? And, and that's when there has to be increased intention and attention to codifying the new energy that's in there, creating the new policies around that new energy and new production and the, and the individuals that are, are part of that production and, and uh, generative energy, all right? Policies, codes of conduct, operating procedures. Uh, as as this as the line in the famous musical Hamilton would say, I want to be in the room where it happens. Okay, individuals that have been excluded need to be in the room where it happens, and what is being asked of them, or what may be received from them, needs to be part of the regulatory process, the political process of that. Of that institution with a small p not a not politics like dc politics um and and so that there's not this wave of energy and then it dissipates and we're back to the status quo we can't go back to the status quo because we see where the status quo has got us can't be exclusionary we have to be very inclusive and we have to be very intentional about that so i applaud uh, the urge team, um, the founders, the leaders, those that are continuing to work and, and folks all across the country that have caught on to the necessity of this. And over the months, I've really plugged into uh, this idea of these urge pods and information sharing, safe space, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, it's awesome. NSF is uh, really glad to be a, a partner and this, I personally am excited about uh, what this may bring, what's going to come of it, and I'm looking forward to the future and, and continuing to watch Urge grow and to be a part of that growth. Thank you to Brandon and thank you to the speakers. And I will now open it up to questions that have been coming in. And I've watched Brandon's video multiple times. And it makes me think each time. So I encourage the audience to go back and, and listen to the words. Now, the first question is for Dr. Estrada. And this was uh, uh, inspired by the what could we be closing statement. And the question goes, as a person who is heavily involved in uh, uh, Be A Jedi initiatives at many levels, when are we going to quantify the finish line? What does the razor sharp vision of being done look like? Wow, that's a big question. I think what I see a lot in the literature is that um, when there, when the population of the administration, the faculty, the students, the staff re reflects the demographic distribution that is in, some people say the local area, the, the state, the nation, but that there is, is full representation at all levels. That's one measurement. Um, another measurement might be that progression through and persistence in disciplines remains the same for all uh, demographic groups and uh, for different social identity, different marginalized groups. Mar so I think that there's different ways people have been measuring this. There's also a sense of, for me, I think that we often don't look at well-being <laughs> and how people are actually feeling and doing. So to me, a healthy outcome would be if, if there's not um, disparity between the health and well-being of people in an institution, that everybody is, is, is at the same health levels and, and well-being levels. So that would be another level of measurement for, for achievement. Um, I'm sure there's many others, but those are the ones I've seen the most noted. Usually it's the demographics. I add the well-being and health. That's kind of mine. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's a very good answer. Thank you. Uh, this question's for uh, Dr. Leinen. 
how can we ensure that these great initiatives are not let down by other actions which uh, reduce uh, access to students, um, such as access to housing, or one of the greatest issues for uh, BIPOC student physical safety is campus policing, uh, something that activists has been working on for years. Um, so how, you know, on one side we have these great initiatives, and then on other side, there's restriction of access and, and, and some of these challenges. Well, the, uh, the university as a whole has been trying to address the, the issue of housing by uh, building substantially more housing for, uh, for students, both graduate students and undergraduate students. We unfortunately live in a community with very high uh, rental costs and the, uh, the university as a whole set the rental uh, price for um, uh, university housing at 20% below the average for uh, the area and it's outstanding housing. So uh, the, you know, that's one thing that we've been able to do. Uh, um, so it was, oh, and, and policing. And I'll let Chancellor Kosla uh, speak as well, but uh, we, uh, all of the cabinet works very closely with him, uh, with our vice chancellor for equity, diversity, and inclusion, and our vice chancellor for resource management, who has all of the campus security services. And I'll include security in general, not just police, uh, because most of our uh, our security is provided by campus security officers that are not armed, uh, that are not, uh, that have a different mandate, which is the security of the individuals. And uh, also by increasing the support for, uh, uh, for mental health, for uh, all of the, the pieces that go around uh, student security. Uh, and then finally, um, really with, within the bounds of what's uh, allowed for, uh, for free speech, uh, trying to really work hard to make sure that, um, uh, that free speech activities are not done in a way that is um, threatening uh, to the best of our ability. And Pradeep, I don't know if you wanna add more to that. No, nope, I think that is well said. Thank you, Margaret. Okay. So the, the next question is, as scientists, we often prioritize research over teaching and our social obligations. How can we ensure that DEI-related funding reaches students and is used to implement solutions to exclusivity as opposed to research and data collection on the problem? And that is open to all three. Shannon, the first lesson you learn is you got to address somebody, otherwise nobody. <laughs> oh, do you want to take this question? <laughs> no, go, go, I'm gonna. Can you just repeat the question, please? How come you can? How can As you? As scientists, we often prioritize research over teaching and our other social obligations. How can we ensure that DEI-related funding reaches students and is and is used to implement solutions to exclusivity, as opposed to research right. and data collection on the problem? So. So I think this is where the administration and how the administration articulates the DEI goals are really, really important. It's very easy for the administration to say, oh, research is more important than teaching, which of course I completely, absolutely disagree with. I think teaching and research are two sides of the same coin. They're equally important. And if I could build a three-sided coin, I would put DEI as a third side of the coin. They cannot be extricated from each other. You cannot uh, be a teacher uh, who's not, how should I say this, uh, being inclusive of all the students in your class. And once you think of doing things that way, then you will end up doing the right thing. So I don't think we should be focused on DEI as a separate one-off project that we check the box, collect the data, and then we move on. And that was a point I was trying to make in my talk. And that's a point that both Margaret and Mika made too, right? So let's just make it clear that we as leaders have to make sure if we were to define a three-sided coin, teaching, research, and EDI, or a four-sided coin, 
uh, service would be the way the coin is going to look like. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that um, having served on a lot of committees for, for grants that are for um, diversity and equity inclusion, that we when we're when we're on these review committees, a lot of times the funding is disproportionately towards faculty and data collection and not enough going down into for student support and such. So mm -hmm. I think that there's another place there in terms of funding and the funding institutions to, to be alert to the fact that that they funding should be spread across and not just um, for for staff to collect data and also to recognize that for a lot of people, it's much more comfortable to collect data than to actually deal with the problem. So, so I think we have to really be alert to the fact that sometimes collecting data, it's really important to do, but it's not the end. The end is not that. It's just a mechanism to know when we are doing the right step on the ground. And so I think we have to be really, really clear about that, that it's not the end goal is not to get the report done. The end goal is to use that report to, to make change happen as has been described um, so that it can inform best practices going forward. So, but I totally agree that, that we can't have excellent education without diversity and inclusion and equity. I mean, these are not separate things. These are all the same thing. And when we finally get our head around that, we're gonna stop, um, putting money into silos and sometimes following the money is a way to know whether the institution really gets it or not. So can I actually make one comment which talks to changing the culture? So like I was department head, I was dean, now as chancellor. I always hear things like, you know what, if you want to be, me to be more diverse, you need to give me more FTEs. And my view is that's a problematic conversation to begin with. You know, your resources are exactly what you have, and you want to be diverse within those resources. So there's no notion of extra FTEs just to hire more women or more African-American people, right? And I think we at UC San Diego have finally driven this point home, and people understand that diversity is part of everyday life. It is not an extra something or the other. That's great. I know a lot of institutions haven't quite figured that out yet. <laughs> so that's great. Thank you guys so much. And uh, with that, I, I think uh, those will be the last questions. And uh, I will end by saying something uh, to the urge participants. Now, as we close the final session, I wanna say thank you to the roughly 4,500 people from nearly 300 institutions that have participated in urge thus far. We would love to hear from you about your experiences during urge. And in the next few weeks, we'll be sending out a survey that we hope everyone will complete. This survey will provide us with valuable information and we really hope that everyone will give back to urge by filling out these surveys. Thank you again. It truly means a lot to have to us to have you on this journey. But I promised you something at the end. Our work does not end here. I am pleased to announce that Urge has a future. First, we will be hosting an Urge Zoom happy hour on Monday, May 17th, 2021. Please stay tuned to your emails for details on this. And we're hoping that everybody who participated in Urge will be able to see each other live on Zoom and have a happy hour together. Second, Urge will return in July for a period we call refinement. During those three months, Urge will facilitate the further development of draft deliverables that you've produced over the past 16 weeks. The last three months of the year, including at GSA and Urge AGU, there will be a period called dissemination, whereby Urge will help pods and pod members facilitate communications or help communicate their proposed policies to leadership and the rest of their communities, so the people who did not participate in Urge. As was done during the first stage, we will be using well-researched structures to keep the community engaged and accountable while fostering the development of new relationships among geoscientists. We will share the structure in the coming months with a projected start date in July. If you have meetings with leaderships and plans in place already with your pods, please do continue to see those through in the name of progress and action. However, the following activities in the refinement and dissemination should be complementary. And I have to say, 
you do not want to miss the next stage of Urge. Thank you. And I hope to see you guys Monday, 17, Monday May 17th at our happy hour celebration. Goodbye. And remember, policies are love language.